Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Our guest today, Par. Par, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you being here. And uh, can you tell us, first of all, where you're calling in from and what you do for a living with Move and EV? I'm calling in from New York City. I uh, just got here actually a couple of days ago. Just moved here. Oh, awesome. And Move and EV is um, our electric bike brand. Also, we do e-scooters as well. We're based in Toronto, actually. And we, we started there about three years ago. And, uh, you know, super blessed and grateful to be able to expand here to a new country, a new city. And yeah, we're about to open our, our new shop here in East Village. Awesome, man. That's amazing. And uh, yeah, welcome to New York. First of all, I'm a lifelong New York native. So welcome. And um, yeah, so I guess uh, just tell me a little bit more about your background, though, and what got you interested in uh, you getting into the electrical bike space. What did you kind of notice out there in the market that you were looking to do a little bit differently or better with this brand specifically? Yeah, you know, my, my journey is a little bit all over the place. I, I did my undergrad in Toronto with in like uh, the medical sciences, pharmacology. And uh, I went to a master's program, did that for about a year. Didn't really like it, although that was the kind of path I was heading down in being in the medical space. So I dropped out and that whole summer of 2020 when COVID hit, a lot of people kind of changed trajectories. I I, I was one of them. I was biking a lot at the time, being outdoors a lot because I really didn't like staying inside. It was kind of driving me nuts. And while I was doing all that, I was kind of looking into the bike industry and then the, I kind of stumbled upon the e-bike industry. I had no clue about e-bikes, you know, up until literally about four years ago uh, when when COVID hit. And that's what kind of started the the journey. You know, I saw that it, the industry was massively growing during that time because everyone was just trying to get out there and especially older adults and a lot of brands were just blowing up. So I figured like, hey, I've always wanted to try business. I like cycling. I've always biked my, my whole life. Never tried e-bikes though. And uh, I approached one of my buddies from university. Uh, we kind of got together. We talked about it. We saw how much resources we had. Like we had some money to buy like a 30 bikes, I think something like that. And that's what kind of kind of got it started. And as for like differentiator, I would say in the e-bike industry, unless you design something from scratch, which could take several years, like three, four years uh, from the time of like design, it's, it's difficult to differentiate unless you got like a really good company culture and really good customer service. I can say for us, at least in Toronto, we have product wise, we have we have some differentiators. We have the longest range options, like a lot of food delivery couriers use our bikes because our batteries are very long range and we have very low uh, warranty uh, incidence rates. So people are, the bikes are super durable and people are not really spending a lot of money out of pocket on repairs. So that's, those are a couple of things that kind of set us apart and we're the top rated e-bike shop in Toronto. Uh, so we, we make sure we're stay on top of that and keep every customer happy because it's very easy to, to get kind of, um, for customers to get pissed off sometimes if you don't give them what they want. But yeah, that's a little bit uh, about us, a little spiel. No, that's awesome. And I mean, believe me, but I mean, here in 2024, customer service is a challenge. I mean, I experience in my everyday life, if I need something from somebody, it's like impossible to get a hold of somebody or you get a bot or something like that. So I think as a differentiator in any industry, you know, if you can really nail it on customer service, I think I think it's a really easy way in 2024, unfortunately, to uh, differentiate yourself, it seems. So, uh, but that's amazing, man. I appreciate you sharing a little bit about your background. And um, when when did you start this? Uh, when did you found this brand initially? By the way, I'm a task earlier as well. Uh, 2021, about uh, spring 2021. Uh, yeah, that's when we started. It's been a bit of a rocky, rocky start. We had to wait for inventory for a long time uh, in the beginning, you know, so we were sitting for months without inventory. That was a bit of a rough, rough period in the beginning. But yeah, about three, three years ago. Awesome. And then so I guess uh, when you started the brand, I mean, what was your general kind of go to market strategy? Assuming during COVID, you know, you're trying to gather some inventory and like, are you like if somebody buys from the website or buys from you, like, do you ship it direct to them? Do they come pick it up? Like, what, what is kind of the logistical side of it look like from that side point of view? Honestly, like when we started we knew nothing like i had no business experience my partner didn't either except like some student clubs but that's not really you know the space so we kind of took it like one day at a time which i don't know if that's a good idea to be honest but i, I didn't have the wherewithal to think like okay well, how should we do this because i had no clue what the best way was we did start online because we just had a website we couldn't afford a warehouse or even like a storage unit right. we obviously had no shop and my my partner lived in a condo and we used the condo's garage, uh, the parking garage to store some bikes. 
which we got in trouble for a few times. <laughs> so uh, once we placed an order for like our initial small batch of bikes, we, we tried to get some pre-orders. We had our website running, no ads. We used also uh, to, to generate leads. That was always like the biggest question. How do we get leads, right? If we can't really afford Facebook ads or this kind of stuff, how do we do it? So we actually started with Facebook Marketplace. We started with that as free. And if you post a lot and it's like pretty well optimized, if you have like a bunch of listings, people are going to reply and they're going to be interested. So we got some initial traction through that. And because the e-bike space was kind of just skyrocketing at that point, we also got some traction through our website, like organically. We had some people interested and they purchased the the bike through there as well. So that was kind of how we how we got the ball rolling before we even got the bikes uh, at our doorstep. That's when we were just waiting for them to, to get to get to us. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody does purchase like your fulfillment process is basically like, will you deliver it to them or would they have like a common space? Like people will come pick them up and check it out. Or like, what did that kind of look like for the, the fulfillment side? I suppose. Yeah. Fulfillment, pretty straightforward. Some places in order, we ship it with one of our delivery partners, UPS, FedEx, or like a local Canadian company. And uh, yeah, they'll receive it in about a week's time. And that's, that's pretty much it. Now that we have this kind of hybrid model, we have stores now, two stores and uh, some dealers. Oh, awesome. as well then uh, people can come in the store and pick it up or they can pick it up from our warehouse. We have a warehouse in Toronto and we're going to open one here as well pretty soon. Yeah, it's awesome. And obviously, you know, kind of higher ticket items like these, I would assume, you know, the sales cycle can be, you know, a little bit longer than something you typically buy, like through e-commerce, you can kind of just buy on a whim. How do you kind of take to, you know, when people write in with questions or they're curious about like, you know, how they can finance? Like, is that, is that an option for people? How do you kind of deal with that? Like, like customer service, not necessarily customer service, I guess more from like a uh, sales perspective. Uh, how do you kind of deal with that? Is, is that something you're still doing kind of completely on your own? Do you have like a team around you now? Or I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have a we have a team now. You know, over time we kind of slowly built it up. We have a PPC for Google Ads, uh, pay per click. Like, just we have that. We have email. We have SEO a person on our team. We have a couple a couple more that help with like besides the employees in the store as well. So th there's there's kind of a a strategy, cohesive strategy to try to get the person in the pipeline from awareness all the way down to purchase. And you're right, it does take longer. And there's so many touch points, which is it's really hard to actually track or attribute the sale because you don't know if someone comes into the store and they purchase a bike, you don't know if they saw it through an ad, if they got a referral to a friend, if they, and that's really hard to track manually. So we're trying to figure out how to track things better, to be honest. But we kind of go off of benchmarks for for ad spend and things like that. Uh, and based off of that, we we know that okay, we're spending the right amount, and this is how many leads we're generating. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's it's pretty difficult to to really uh, attribute a sale to a particular like ads channel unless they it's super clear. Like it's I would say maybe a quarter of our sales we can attribute very accurately. The rest are. We're still trying to figure it out. But as long as the trend, you know, is growing, as long as we're growing, then we know, okay, we're doing something, something right. Yeah. The most important metric, which is growth and revenue, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I know it can be, I know it can be difficult with, um, you know, naturally if you have like brick and mortar stores and people can actually come in and dealerships and things like those are kind of like, you, know, you can't really track those things. Like a lot of people that come on the podcast are um, like food and drink CPG brand owners. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is like, it's great to get into like retail store shelves, but like you kind of lose all that data rather than when you sell, you know, direct to consumer with completely digital marketing, because that is all easily tracked. But when you kind of move off of the completely digital, you know, some of the, some of those things can get lost in translation, but I think it's still, you know, I think you're still optimizing for, you know, the general just kind of marketing adage of like, it might take whatever, depending on what you ask, so, you know, eight to 10 touches to convert to a sale. Uh, I think existing in those like store shelves at dealerships and online and all these other avenues, I think, can just kind of bump those up over time. So I'm not surprised that you're seeing, you know, obviously, obviously growth with like, you know, so many channels to get eyes on. So that definitely makes sense. So yeah, I guess I'm just curious as well, like, you know, from what you can tell from the data that you do have, especially when you, you know convert sales online, um, what kind of seems to be your like ideal customer or like target demographic for like who's actually buying these things? Is there like a specific age range, gender, profession, kind of geographic area? Uh, what do you kind of find in that regard from what you can tell from the data you do have? Yeah, so good question. And I think every kind of brand, this has always been a question for us, like where do we focus on? Because there are some like I would say general e-bike brands that kind of cater to everybody commuters which are usually younger people working professionals older adults which just use them for you know for fun or for exercise you know and like everything in between that that's you're kind of going from like 25 to up to like 60 like that's like pretty much everybody right and you also have food delivery gig workers so it's a really mixed bag and for us we kind of want to want the, the products to 
to speak for themselves and for the products to be appealing to the customer and, and to whoever they're going to be appealing to. Because e-bikes are, they're very universal. A anybody can use them. And it's just on your preferences and what you want. If you want a lighter e-bike for commutes, that's great for commuters, you know, or someone that lives in an apartment that, that doesn't need to like carry an 80 pound bike upstairs or up the elevator. If you're a food delivery worker, you need like something heavier with fat tires and a big battery, something durable that's going to last you a long time. So for us, it really is a mixed bag. I would say about uh, half of our customers are in that commuter, older adult range, uh, you know, just people that that want the e-bike for to go to work or just for, for, for leisure. And about the other 50%, which are mostly through our physical shop, are food delivery, food courier customers, because they they live in like the, the downtown, the city center. And I, I know you've seen like in New York, there's so many of these guys. Oh, yeah. Out. Yeah, yeah. There's so many. Uh, it's same thing in Toronto, and they operate on word of mouth a lot. So if they see a shop, they come in also for repair and servicing. So yeah, I would say about 50-50 in that kind of range. And definitely more of our like online orders come from uh, the commuter and the older adults. And these these are the orders that we ship out to, you know, across the country and whatnot. So yeah, it's 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 a bit of a mixed bag for sure. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And Par, one question I always love to ask everybody that comes on the podcast, knowing everything you know now, all the experiences you've been through being in Toronto, moving to New York, um, if you could go back and give yourself any one piece of advice, if you were to start this business again, what do you think that piece of advice would be? That's a good question. Piece of advice for myself. To be honest, I would say like not to worry so much. I know that might be super simple, but I'm the kind of person to be a bit paranoid or on the negative side of things. And that can waste so much time and take away from what you have to do. So if I had a way to just switch that up, which I got much better at it now, I would say like the fear and the worry, like that's really like a, it, it just kills momentum. It kills everything. Even if things are looking really dark to whoever, you know, watching this and they're just start a startup or they're working, you know, you need to turn that, that thing off because even as you grow, it's not going to get easier. It's actually like the hardest part, like right now, like opening in a new country for us. It's it's the most challenging it's ever been. So I would say that. And why I'm saying that is because really the most I've learned in the, in this business is like about myself, my own personality and my the, the, the character traits that I'm kind of lacking, the things that I'm good at and the things that are like really you know, everyone has their like negative traits, but when you, when you go on, on, on a business path, those things get amplified times like a thousand percent and you get to see it first time. Like, Oh, I didn't know I, I could react in such a negative way to something like this. So yeah, that fear and that worry thing, I would just tell myself to work on that more and to shut it off because I would have made a lot more progress had I not uh, fixated on that so much. You know, I think, I think it's good advice and you're probably not surprised to hear that it's actually a very common answer that I get to that question, whether somebody is, you know, been in business for 20 years or two months, it's a very, very common uh, answer I get to that. And I think the general sentiment is, the point is really well taken, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs get into business and they can be kind of perfectionists. You know, I think that's, that's the reason you get into you know, entrepreneurship in general, because you think you can deal with anything that comes and like you obviously can, you've gone through this much this far, but in doing so you try to plan too much sometimes ahead of time. And it's like that old marketing adage of like, you know, if you're not embarrassed by the first thing that you bring to market, you probably did it too late. So I know, I think, I think it's really good advice. And, you know, by the time, like I've heard that, like maybe like 40 to 50 times on the podcast, it's not really anecdotal evidence anymore. I think it's really like, advice that people should take if anybody listening is looking to you know get into their first entrepreneurial venture this one of the that's actually one of the biggest things that i hear on the podcast so i, I appreciate your perspective adding to that conversation because I, th I think it is really really important and Par, also just want to give you an opportunity quickly, just for anybody listening, might be interested in you know checking out your products or maybe potentially getting in touch with you for potentially maybe like a, a business partnership or anything. Uh, what's the best way to stay in touch with you all and yourself personally? I am on, on Twitter. I'm just trying to post on there so that's how i got in touch with you guys got in touch with me so that was pretty sweet i meet a lot of cool people on there mm -hmm. p drabi or par i think you can find me on, on there that's pretty much the, the best way to be honest i try to post there as much as i can just share the l's share the wins like everything you know uh as much as i can because i see other people are doing it and and you know they're kind of just out there in the open so i figured you know why not i'll, I'll do that as well and whoever wants to listen great you know, it doesn't take anything away. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's definitely something I try to bring through the podcast as well as getting like real accounts from real entrepreneurs that are just out there making it happen because you can get stuck in this trap, as I'm sure you know, just seeing things on social media. People like, I made a million dollars last month in my first yeah, month in business. It's awesome. like, no, it's that's not true, man. Like, <laughs> I know you took years to build this thing up. Now you're just like, you know, posting that for the clout. But so I'm trying to bring these like very real stories. So I really appreciate you being a part of this conversation and sharing your real story and background. And, um, 
Um, you know, the highs and lows that come with being an entrepreneur. I think that's the most important thing for anybody to come in with is just that kind of nuance and perspective that like, no, it's not going to be easy. No, you're not going to hit the lottery. Yes, it's going to take way longer than you think. But, you know, if you have the wherewithal to stick it out, like there's really beautiful things at the end of that tunnel, even though, you know, there's struggles along the way. So I really appreciate your perspective on that. And uh, I think it's one of the most important things if anybody's listening that, you know, is a young entrepreneur or is looking to be an entrepreneur. So I think it's one of the most important things to understand. So. Yeah, no, for sure. Like patience is uh, the key. Like everyone says that, mm -hmm. everyone says that. And and you, you kind of don't really know what, what the end result will be until you just stick with it. Like I hadn't, we had no clue we would, you know, sell our first batch of bikes. And then we had no clue we would be able to get a store. And then we didn't have like New York on a plan three years ago. Like, yeah, we're going to go to New York. We didn't have that. Maybe some guys, they're like super laser focused and, and they have good experience and they can put something on the vision board from like day one. And then three years later, they're there. Great. Kudos to them. Like, I think those guys are super rare. But even if, if you don't have that kind of skill set or, or or that kind of background it's also fine as long as you just get started and you just do something every day give yourself time to rest don't be so hard on yourself eventually you'll find that wow you just made like nothing uh, something out of nothing you know and it's it's pretty amazing even for me to see it today like wow this we actually did this and we're still doing it and you know we're just gonna keep doing it till the wheels fall off no yeah pun <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say, no pun intended. Um, no, but it's it's so it's so true, right? And I think even like you know, you speak about like that scenario where like you think about somebody is like, okay, like we start in Toronto in three years, we're gonna be in New York. It's like if that's your plan in the beginning, like the chances of the things that are out of your control leading to that actually happening, like it's it's just so like out of it's it's you have to get incredibly lucky for that plan to stick, starting something from the beginning. And I think yeah. you can actually kind of go wrong, like trying to fit in your master plan from day one into something where like it doesn't really Really make sense now it's three years down the line just because you told yourself you wanted to be in new york maybe that doesn't make sense now at this point and like you're trying to shoehorn that into your business plan because you just thought of it at the beginning i think a lot of people can kind of fall into that trap too so i think if, if anything it's probably even better to just understand that you know it, it's like you plan you get there all hell breaks loose and you just keep going right so yeah. um no I, I i really appreciate your perspective on, on all these things par i think it's a it's a really important conversation and i think some of my favorite feedback i get from the podcast is you know People feeling like they're on an island as young entrepreneurs, not really feeling like anybody understands where they're at. So I appreciate you being a part of this community and coming on, man. Yeah, yeah, no, I thanks for having me. I feel like I feel like I'm on like Joe Rogan or something. This is my first podcast. <laughs> I, I, I listen I listen to a lot of podcasts too, so it's really cool to actually to be on one. So yeah, that that's really sweet. I was like, oh wow, well, podcast, like yeah, it's sweet. I'll, I'll go on. Why not? Thanks for having me on too. That's great. Yeah, man. Your perspective is super valuable. I really appreciate you. I just want to wish you the best of luck and continued success in all you're doing, man. I love your passion for what you do. And yeah, man, just keep going. I really appreciate you being here and I uh, look forward to staying in touch as well. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely uh, add you on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm here in New York as well. So we'll definitely get together sometime as well. Yeah, yeah. 95 Avenue B, East Village. I'll send you. We're not fully set up yet. That's where we're going to set up about awesome. two weeks from now. It's going to be live. And yeah, man, appreciate it. Yeah, man. I spent a lot of time right in Midtown, so won't be far from you. Okay. Awesome, man. It. I appreciate you, man. Thanks. Thanks, Par. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.